If you asked me to build you a boat, I would charge you $10 billion because I don't know how to build a boat. We've got 200 containers on the water right now. Man, right. that's amazing. We're here to make money. Oh, that guy's a stick. We've actually done some, some testing. I'm not a stick. How much would you pay for every meal that you cook at your house to be 10% better for the next two years? Tens of billions of dollars a year. It was never worth that. I just think all of us could use a kick in the pants to get more radical. Like for sure. Mike has guiding principles we should all adopt. Okay, how many paper clips do I get for the price? How's that compared to these other generic brands? And I'm just buying the cheapest paper clips. I've never heard that before. I'm sure I'll come to like it. It's like eye popping. All right, welcome to episode 18 of the Operators Podcast. Today, we are digging into pricing, all things pricing, your products, your company. As always, this episode is brought to you by Northbeam, Senlane, and Fulfill. So thank you to the sponsors. Let's dig into it. Destin, Destin is a hot spot. Hey, Mike, it is Destin golf? and Seaside. Uh, I occasionally, not well, but I do, I do play occasionally. I, you're a big golfer, right, Jason? I've been working on it. Danny and Cole. What's the handicap? play golf. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of like shooting mid 90s right now. I haven't done the handicap, but I just joined a club. So I'm looking forward to improving Let's my go. game. I learned I learned a new golf slang term. If someone's really good, you call them a stick. I've never heard that before. <laughs> You're like, oh, that guy's a stick. Like yeah. that guy's that guy's good. I'm not a stick yet, but I'm getting there. That's my old man. My old man can play golf, although he plays, he lives in fricking on a golf course in Phoenix, right. <laughs> plays like twice a day. It's all he does is play golf, but son of a, he can play golf, man. It's on, it's unreal. I hate the sport. Uh, I'm sure I'll come to like it at some point, you know, Jason, I'm, I'm just a few years behind you. So I'll, I'll Good. get there, man. I think my generation, when we get older, we'll just play video games. I think we'll Call of Duty. <laughs> Call of Duty is the new golf. I for, don't know. Uh, you, did you guys see the the Callaway Top Golf numbers from the last week? Like, big, holy! Yeah. So that I'm is very, impressive. So I'm very close with a lot of the Callaway team. We obviously are close with with the Travis Matthew team. We did a collab there, but. You know, about four years ago, Callaway just became the top golf company. Like Top Golf is like a huge growth center. Like it's the next bowling. Like it's it's half their earnings, right? And they have a huge portfolio. They own a ton of brands, like they sell a ton of stuff, but but the future of that company is Top Golf. Yeah, the clubs are tough to make money on. There's something about it. I was actually talking to the pro a pro about this and like cl clubs are not a moneymaker. Golf clubs are not a moneymaker. Um they're like surfboards. It's like, you know, they're, it's like the, the flagship item. It's sexy. It's cool. But like, you only need one set. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but Matt, it's like a mattress. Is it, uh, I, I, do you guys actually think, so this actually, and too bad Connor's not here because we were talking about this yesterday from like an alternative, like, uh, from our last episode, right? Like alternative revenue, like how are brands doing this now? Like Callaway's sort of just put on a masterclass of like, this is not even selling goods. They bought an experience center. And I'm wondering if it's, in, if it's influencing sales of like, that's, that's exactly product. what it is. It's a flywheel thing. Like I've thought about this. I really would love to get into a consumable at some point. Um, just because the, the, you know, the market size on a consumable is so much bigger. We sell water bottles that'll last, you know, for years. And I watch people like prime hydration where like, it's like people can drink several of those in a day. And so anyways, I've been thinking about consumables. One of the things I've realized is the, the biggest difficulty in creating a consumable is that you have to get people to taste it, to want to continue to buy it, but they won't buy it if they haven't tasted it. And so like, how do you solve for that? Same. And the, it's sampling is the answer. And so yeah, like, Top Golf is sampling for Callaway. It's brilliant, right? Like you mm -hmm. give, you give a bunch of people the opportunity to, to play with your clubs and, and to sample and then. Uh, your showrooming basically your product. Mm. Yeah, they have they have pro shops basically at every Top Golf. Like you can buy Ridge wallets there now, right? Because uh, mm. the Travis Matthew collab. The only thing that I think analysts should be aware of is the quality of revenue of of a Top Golf versus like a you know the Callaway brand or the Travis Matthew brand. Like you know they're they're, they're selling beers and they're selling hot dogs and they're selling you know 
entertainment time, right? And th- that's a great business. Like that's that's most of Disney's profit comes from their their parks. Mm-hmm. But I I just you know it's it's hard to compare the apples to oranges of D to C brand revenue versus uh, entertainment revenue. And Mike, I'd love for you to just like keep going on this. Because when you were talking about like I sell something that like a, a water bottle or a tumbler, whatever, that lasts forever, and versus like a bottle of Prime, those are two wildly different margin mm-hmm. models, pricing models, like everything about those two things. They're so far apart, right? So like we want to talk pricing today. I think that's probably going to naturally dovetail into some amount of like merchandising and assortment and all that stuff. But maybe Mike kick us off. Talk about how you guys landed on, like, how do you come up with the price of your products? And then maybe we can go to Sean and then Jason, I'd love to hear your thoughts after Sean, if that's cool. Yeah. So uh, historically we had, we entered into our market. There were already a lot of competitors. Hydroflask's already established. Yeti is already established and has had kind of their breakthrough uh, with their Tumblr line, the Rambler line. Um, so I always felt like we're late to the party. There've been a couple of brands that have come in after us and found success in, in the hydration space, but most of the players that are successful today existed before we came in and we looked at the market and really felt like it was going to be tough to be at the kind of price points that Hydroflask and Yeti were at and, and get in any kind of significant market share. So in some ways we had some of our pricing decisions made for us. Uh, when you come into a market, you can. there's a lot of different ways that you can choose to attack it, depending on how early you are and the competitors. We had a more narrow band, I think, of possibilities and opportunities where we, we realized we're going to need to tell some kind of a value story here. And if we can't tell a value story, it's going to be difficult to to gain share. And the thing that we noticed was we wanted to start with digital as a channel specifically we want to start with amazon and there was room for us to be competitively priced on amazon significantly undercutting what we felt like were the top tier brands at the time Um, so offering a much better value proposition with the same level of quality and that's actually where we started with our pricing thought process was how our consumers going to perceive our product in relation to these brands that they already know? Um, and can we hit the same quality at a much more attractive price point um, in, in the channel that works for us? And can we make that work? And fortunately, that was, that was a winning combination for us at the time. The way that's evolved as we've gotten bigger as a company is that we think about our brand as living at this nexus or intersection of three things, relevant style, premium quality, affordable price. And we try to fulfill that brand promise. Um, and that looks different in different categories in terms of like, we, we definitely don't have like a cost plus model, but usually that means that we, we are at least on some level conscious of, are we telling a good value story with everything that we do? Mike, <laughs> could you double down on what a cost plus model would be? just so that people can understand the different types. Yeah. So when we say cost plus pricing, what you're really doing is you're just saying, hey, kind of all in, here are my costs to get this product to the customer, whether that's, you know, my wholesale minus all my discounts, or that's my my landed cost plus my fulfillment or whatever in D2C. It's just like, this is is what's going to cost to get it to them. And I'm going to try and make X amount of markup on that. So I'm going to take my cost and I'm going to add X amount of markup. And then that's going to dictate where I want to live as my retail price. So you're kind of um, working working backwards from the plus part of cost plus. Um, the, there's some strengths to that model. Uh, the, the strength to that model, I think, is you can say, hey, we really need to be at X points of margin in order for the financials to work. And we don't want to be any higher than we need to be because it's such a competitive market. I think the weaknesses of that model, and for a while, I think we really were more of a cost plus type of perspective, Sean. I think the weaknesses of that model uh, are that it really doesn't take into account the way that the customer is going to perceive things and how your pricing is going to compare to competitors. So a really good example is, if you're using a cost plus model, you might come to a conclusion like 
hey, uh, okay, for us to hit our margin, we need to be at $20.99. $20.99 is the retail on this item. But from a consumer-facing perspective, the difference between $20.99 and $21.99 and $22.99 might not be that big. But there is a big uh, psychological difference when you break $20. Right. Or another example of where cost plus can be more challenging is you're going up against a competitor on a shelf like in Target. Okay, this is our main competition when we're selling tumblers and we know that they're at twenty four ninety nine. So the difference between us being at twenty ninety nine and twenty two ninety nine is probably not that big when our competitors at twenty four ninety nine, because this is the way that practically the consumer is going to compare these two products. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that it is, you know, the bottoms up approach. You typically find it in 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 B two B sales, right? Mm -hmm. And I always bring up T shirts as the best example. That if you want a Bruno Brunelli Cachelli T shirt, it's four hundred dollars. If you want a James Purse T shirt, it's a hundred dollars. If you want a Buck Mason T shirt, it's thirty two dollars. If you want a Hanes T shirt, it's nine. So there's customers all the way up the curve. And a cost plus model would be like, hey, we're selling t-shirts to the army. (laughs) Like Mm -hmm. our cost is $5. We need to make 20% margin. We'll sell to them for $6, right? Uh, You know, and it's interesting to think about a consumer brand taking the cost plus model. And I bet a lot of Chinese sellers on Amazon do that where they're like, what is the bare minimum I can possibly charge for this? Yeah. And I think think that a point that we're going to get into, but I'll go ahead and introduce the concept is... The way that you choose to price your product is defining where you have to be excellent operationally, right? So to your example, Sean, if I'm a, if I'm a Chinese factory, I know that I need to be excellent operationally at producing goods at an inexpensive cost because that's going to be the driver of my success because I'm in a, you know, my cost plus 10% or whatever model. And so I need to be great at hitting a low cost per unit to be effective because that's my strategy. If I'm trying to sell $400 t-shirts, the cost it it is to make that t-shirt matters almost none to me. It's almost exclusively a marketing and desire game that I'm playing, which is a, you know, and branding game, which is a very different type of game and a very different set of organizational excellence that I've got to build to be successful playing that game. I I guess the, and the other way to look at this is like, um, is like, is price less of a math problem and more of a judgment problem on behalf mm-hmm. of the, like, like from a customer's perspective, right? It's like, I've emotionally decided I want something. Now I'm rationally going to try to like make a judgment call. Like, should mm-hmm. I buy that? And that seems to be where price does matter. Like Sean, that whole, like the curve, there's a lot less customers way up at the top. And you know, there's a significant amount way at the bottom. So like you have to choose which game you're playing, but like, you know, which is a good point. Like, how do you guys at Ridge deal with this? Because I don't know what a men's wallet costs. I know what a Ridge wallet costs. And you guys mm-hmm. get a lot more searches than men's wallets. But like, when you came in, was it wallets cost this, we should be competitive? Or were you like, nah, this is what ours is going to be. Because like, we think the value is this. And like, how did you come up with the pricing for Ridge? Yeah. Uh <laughs> So we have a pretty long and extensive price history. So I'll try not to monologue here, but when I came in, a Ridge wallet cost $45, I think. It might have been $65, right? Whoa. And in the past, I don't know, six years or whatever of working with the business, maybe it's longer at this point, seven years, we've increased prices by, you know, on average 65% or whatever. And I was I was laser focused on on getting that AOV up. Um and to explain the wallet market, uh, there's there's two ends of the spectrum and there's nothing in the middle. So wallets are either a commodity good that you buy from a Walmart or a Target or whatever because you need one and a men's buying it for himself. So it's a $10 item or a $15 item. And it really is like a commodity good cost plus what is the cheapest I can get this wallet for? Because the alternative is just putting your cards in your pocket. And that's what my dad used to do. Just like all of his cards in his pocket. And that was it. Uh, The other end of the market is um, luxury brands selling small leather goods. So I was talking to the old buyer of Barney's yesterday and 60% of Gucci sales were small leather goods, right? Specifically, 
wallets or bags or purses or whatever. And the luxury end of the small other good market of the wallet market is tens of billions of dollars a year. Like, wow, really more than like car company sales, right? But you know, there's a couple of things there. It's the cheapest thing in the market that has a Gucci logo, right? So if you really are bought into the Gucci lifestyle and you can't afford the runway pieces or whatever else, you can buy the wallet for $400. So when Ridge came out, there was nobody in between. And what we saw is that like, look, there's white space for a giftable product uh, somewhere between these two. So we, we've been pushing the boundary to figure out like what the perfect price point there is. Our entry price for an aluminum wallet right now is $95. We think that's perfect for gifting. It's under a hundred bucks. Your daughter will buy it for you, you as like a gift for Father's Day or your wife will get it for you or you'll get it for your dad. Or there's like, there's, there's so much gifting going on. That's probably over half of our sales is gifting. And that's why we landed the $95 price point. Um, and so we looked at that curve, right? And every this is this comes as natural and second nature to people that like the cheaper something is, the more you'll sell, the more expensive something is, the less you'll sell. And it's just finding where you maximize dollars of profit along that. The only caveat that I'll bring up is that there is a special category of goods called Veblen goods who the more you price it, the more demand there is for them, right? And like the examples of those would be like, extreme luxury or rare products where people are buying them just because of how expensive they are, right? Is so, that like a Supreme? Would they be an example of that? Where like, or was that just because of their model, the drop model? Because I felt like that was just like, who is paying this for? Yeah. A team? Like, I think, I think su Supreme, a lot of luxury fashion falls in there. I think the best example of a Veblen good was, was Board Ape Yacht Club, where people were, were spending a hundred thousand or $300,000 on the NFT mostly for the novelty of how expensive it was. If you ever want something just because it's expensive, that's a Veblen good. And that's a special category. Wallets don't fall into that. But like there is a set of consumer goods that fall outside of our spectrum. 99% of things fall in that curve where it's like the more expensive it is, the less people will buy it. So you just want to find your perfect price point. I think we found that at Rich. And, and are you using... I mean, I'm assuming you're going to use assortment to like find higher price points and decorating and like different style, right? So like there's design, I guess, would be the bucket that you can put it in. Yeah. Our best selling wallet is one of the more expensive ones, right? Mm. So we have, we have entry level products that are $95 that are great for gifting. But if, you know, if someone's shopping for themselves or wants to elevate it, we use material or color or, or selection to, you know, to, to elevate that up. And we are probably a ton of success with that. I think inflation's helped that like what used to be a $99 gifting price cap is now a $150 gifting price cap or a $200 gifting price cap. So like we launched Smokey Bear wallets, they're $125. Like they sell out in two weeks, right? Like, and we, I think that's, uh, you know, going back to Mike has guiding principles, we should all adopt. Like we're delivering a good product at a fair price, right? We're delivering value to our customers. We could price those Smoky Bear wallets at $250 and maybe do the same revenue, but over a longer period of time. And maybe we'll do that in the future, but but yeah, assortment can drive the price up, right? I think we found a floor and then we experiment with the ceiling. A few things that I love about Sendline first, um, it's a premium product at affordable prices. You know, like that's how we built the Simple Modern brand was, hey, we're going to make something that's as good as anything out there, but we're going to make the pricing affordable. It's definitely true about Sendlane. Run by an operator that's got 14 years of email experience. He ran a, a D2C company. So he really understands that their team really understands what their customers need and want. They built a product based on their experiences. And I, I think it's been mentioned on this show before, but like they do a great job of engaging with the community via the social platforms, you know, Twitter, I guess threads now, whatever. Um, they really t are talking to people and asking them what they want. Uh, recently, they rolled out reviews as a free add on to what they were they were offering already. And then, you know, uh, Clavio really quickly, like a week later, two weeks later, rolled it out, but it costs money with Clavio. But it's a good example of, I think they're really listening to their customer. 
Um, I, I think that when you're buying any software solution, because, you know, even though you can switch, switching costs are real. Like you got to train people on a new platform uh, and it's just, it's a hassle always to switch. So I really try and pay attention to what is the, tra- not just where is the product right now, but what's the trajectory of the product? I'm really impressed with the trajectory of their product. They've gone from not on my radar um, to being very impressed with what they're building over the last six months, just because of the trajectory and the rate of development. Um, and so it's not just like, hey, where's the software that you're committing to? Where is it today? It's where is it going to be six months, uh, a year from now? Finally, uh, I've, I've done email. Um, I've invested in email uh, providers. Um, and I would say the number one danger in email is if you get poor deliverability, all this segmenting, all these hacks, all, you know, tricks and, and tips, none of that matters if you don't have good deliverability. And if you're trying to pick an email provider, you need somebody who really gets deliverability and knows how to troubleshoot deliverability issues. Uh, and they're really strong. Their in-house uh, team that can diagnose and help with deliverability issues is really strong. And uh, they share some of that content uh, even publicly, which is really helpful. So big fan of Sendlane, big fan of people building uh, exceptional products. Jason, what at Hexclad? I mean, you guys, you guys are just like the rocket ship. How much time goes into what are we pricing things at? Like I know earlier this year in our chat, you were talking like you guys were actually running out. Like you would run out of product because Q4 was so big. Did you? When you ran out of product, did you just price it all, or like how does this how does this show up for Hexclad? Yeah, let, just me, start let me unpack this. Let me unpack this. There's a lot to it. First of all, when we started out. Danny and Cole started out. Like the pricing was, what's the price where we're going to make money, right? Like, <laughs> we're here to make money. Like, what does that mean? What is a gross margin that gets us to a profit? That makes sense, right? If you it all starts with unit economics. I talk about it all the time. We we got to understand the below the line dynamics of our business. So, um, the initial pricing was really a set of cookware. It's like, all right, what's a gross margin where we ultimately get a bottom line profit that we like and think that we can actually sell it at that price, and then that's evolved into. I mean, that's fundamentally how we start, but then of course we tweak it to to optimize conversion and i want to get into that if i have an interesting question for everybody but to answer the specific point about changing prices raising prices um we've actually our prices in costco have been the same since day one and we haven't raised them since 2017 we don't sell that wow SKU. we don't sell every skew there on our site because we sold so much in Q4, we did raise the prices of a number of individual items. And surprisingly, it um, while volume was down a little bit on those items, overall net profit was up a lot. And so we've kind of kept it there. And it also gives us an opportunity that if we really want to step on the gas, we can discount those. So during Prime Day on Amazon, we did 20% discounts on those items, which have not been discounted all year long. And so, you know, there's that consumer that's waiting for it. And so we've also um, been creative with our bundling, which um, you can kind of play a little bit of a shrinkflation game. For us, it wasn't really about playing games. It was about optimizing our packaging container loads. We've got 200 containers on the water right now. Um, So when you get that right, it means something. Um, But, and then we do a lot of price testing now. We, uh, I won't, I won't disclose the source who we use unless they decide to sponsor the pod. But (laughs) um, the, uh, we do a lot of price testing on all of our products. We constantly have price testing going in the background. But the thing that I wanted to ask you guys is, you know, a lot of this is, there's also the whole psychology aspect of pricing, right? And 
the 399 versus 400 i would love to get your oh, guys man. opinion on that because there's 399 there's 399.99 and then there's 400 right how do you think about that uh i just want to jump in and say that the container ship having 200 containers that's an insane flag, number that's so yeah. much that's <laughs> insane jason You've got a fleet. You have a fleet like an armada of hex clad <laughs> traveling across the ocean. That would make such a good video. Of there's like... the U.S. Navy. There's there's Britain's Navy, and then there's the hex clad, you know, envoy. And those are the three great naval powers we, of our time. Have, August and September production are those numbers. It's like eye popping. Man, right. that's amazing. Well, so I actually have a really unique insight here that comes from a previous uh, e-commerce venture I was a part of. Um, many years ago, we started a company with my brother, an e-commerce concept, and it didn't work, but we pivoted it to this other idea that also didn't work, but was really interesting, especially around pricing. The concept was it was an auction website where the price would start out high, like at full retail. For something and then every second that price would go down like a certain number of cents until either one of two things happened either somebody said i'm going to buy it for that price or it hit a cap that you didn't know about if you were the customer watching the auction where it just went away so for example hey here's this blender it's going to start at 40 dollars. it's going to tick down in price uh, on the system is set up where if it gets to thirty two dollars, it just goes away. Nobody gets it. But if somebody jumps in there before thirty two dollars and says, "I'm going to buy it," then it, they they can buy it at that price. So it was an interesting idea. Ultimately, didn't work. But what was super interesting about it is that I was able to do a lot of looking at price behavior and how do people respond at different prices? Because we might take that same blender that starts at 40 and counts down and we might run that auction a thousand times over a month. And so I could watch how a bunch of different people in a bunch of different situations treated things. Here's what I can say definitively. There is something psychological. It is real. There's a psychological thing about breaking thresholds. Like you break $10 and you go to $9.99. There is like the curve becomes uneven. You have a steady curve and then there's a gap up in demand once you break uh, from 10 to 9.99. In the same way, Jason, like or from 19.99 to 20 or from you know 100 to 99.99. So I, I do think it's real psychologically and. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's always better to go three ninety nine ninety nine instead of four hundred. I think some of it depends on the story that you're trying to tell. But I can at least say that psychologically, I have seen a lot of quantitative evidence that it is meaningful and it it's that people aren't. You know, we we think about people as being rational, and I, I think this is at the core of what we're talking about today. How rational are people when they think about purchasing decisions? And the answer is some They're not. You know, they're, 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 they're somewhat in some situations. We give people and way too not. much credit for being rational in the in Yeah, world. that's what I mean by it's like, this is all about judgment, right? It is like, about judgment. It's not about math. This is, this is like human judgment. One of the things that I think Sean mentioned earlier that I do also, I want to come back to because I think it's a, it's a key point. Um, Nate Poland did a series on Twitter where he, he, one of the things he did is he posted a, a pretty good talk about pricing that a guy gave. Oh, it's one of my Stanford. favorites. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But but the the guy basically makes the argument that there there are times where people are rational and use kind of their rational brain, and then there's times where they don't use their rational brain, and there's this dance of consumers sometimes using their rational brain and sometimes using their irrational brain in making decisions, and or maybe not irrational brain, but they use a different uh, some different muscles when they're making decisions. The more commoditized your product is the more people are going to be rational is basically what I have found. So like if you're selling paper clips, like they're just going to be super rational and say, okay, how many paper clips do I get for the price? How's that compared to these other generic brands? And I'm just buying the cheapest paper clips. And Sean made a really good point for our product. We're in the most commoditized. I think out of the four of us, we were in the most commoditized industry. Probably. I don't know. Dude, um, I have cell phone cases. 
Okay, well, the, yeah. If, if if we're talking about Pila case, I think I think you're right. I think Lomi is not at all. Yeah, Lomi Lomi's like the opposite. I was Pila thinking case more of Lomi. Like, it's very competitive. No, it's yeah. a great point. But but if we if we say okay, uh, Lomi and and Ridge and Hexclad and Simple Modern, we're in the most commoditized oh, sure. industry. And what I have seen uh, in a, almost a jarring way is when we are trying to sell just another black insulated water bottle, it is very price sensitive. And the, like when we when we run sales and the price sensitivity curve is really, uh, it's really amazing. When we bring out a new ornamentation, like a blush leopard is one that we've had that people really like, it all goes out the window in every channel. Like it doesn't matter if it's Walmart or our website or Amazon or whatever, all of a sudden people are willing to spend 30, 40, 50, 70% more and they don't think twice about it. But the reason is because that ornamentation has taken it from being a commoditized thing in their mind to being something unique and bespoke. And now they're using a different part of their brain and evaluating what's the price that I would pay on that. And so um, I think that you have to be realistic with yourself about, am I offering something that's really differentiated or is more commoditized because that's going to make a bunch of the pricing decisions for you. But the goal obviously is that you're trying to create something that feels like it doesn't have a lot of comparables to the customer because the more that the customer has kind of substitutes and comparisons, the more that you're going to kind of get pushed into whatever other people are doing and what the market's doing, the more you feel like you have something truly differentiated or unique, the more you set the price for your product. And this is what the great luxury, you know, this is why Louis Vuitton can charge whatever, because there's one Louis Vuitton, they have a very distinctive look. And if you want Louis Vuitton, you pay the Louis Vuitton price. Um, so anyway, I, I think that that's an interesting principle that I'm learning in our business that's been really helpful in us trying to figure out how do we make our margins healthy. The answer is we have got to innovate around how it looks. Yeah, it's um, the talk you're referring to. I think his name is Michael, Michael Deering, Michael. Like, yeah, Michael Deering, I think um, it's brilliant because he got he goes into like how for consumers, there's intuition and then there's reason. Right, those are the two parts of the brain that they're that he's talking about. And then, really, when you when you really get into it, like what consumers are doing is everything has a little spot in their brain, right? Like there's all little buckets. And when they're buying, there's like substitutes and compliments, right? Is what you're hitting on. So, like, is there a comparative substitute for the thing I am looking at right now that I'm like very aware of? And you know, if it's like, if your thing in their mind is like, that's the same thing, it's, but it's way more money, you're going to sell a lot less of those than yeah. the other thing, right? Like the bl black, you know, simple modern bottle versus a black Yeti bottle. They're just going to buy more of the simple modern one. It's a right. better price. There's right. no difference between the and, two. And we definitely have ridden that horse, you know, to grow the brand sure. considerably. And now we're trying to learn how do you, how do you evolve to be more than that. And, and we've had some success, but, it, but that's our challenge. I do think to go back to the hex cloud example, Jason, a, a good example of why you have so such pricing power, I think is how much would you pay for every meal that you cook at your house to be 10% better for the next two years? Well, I don't know a lot, a huge number, right? So you charging $400 for a pan. It's like, if, if my food comes out better it, it, for the next couple of years, like I'm willing to pay a lot for that. And it's, it's one of the things about having a truly differentiated or exceptional product. If you're, if you really do have a better mousetrap, then all of a sudden you can make quite a case to the customer that you deserve a huge premium over your competitors. Here's what I want to talk about for Phil. Have either of you guys passed an audit? Have, are you, do you guys have audited financials? Okay. I could not get audited financials. Uh, we spent probably over a million dollars last year on accounting services, right? Uh, and a lot of that went to Armanino, our accounting firm, to get our, our books ready to be audited. And then some of it went to Moss Adams to audit those books. This was for 2021. We could probably pass it on for 2022, but... Uh, you know, wh why did that cost me so much money? Why did it cost me a million dollars? And I still probably couldn't pass that audit. It's because of the way we bought inventory. Uh, we did not have an ERP. We were not measuring inventory into our business, through our business, out of our business. It was done via spreadsheets. And I bet a lot of brands listening to this right now are like, 
Yeah, that's how we do it. <laughs> you place a PO and it kind of shows up and no one's matching it back. Like all of these stupid fucking accounting things uh, that apparently the world really cares about. And I've told some people this. We had a offer to buy Ridge for hundreds of millions of dollars, right? And that's why we spent a million dollars auditing it. It was like, okay, fine. We'll go through this process. If someone's going to give us multiple hundreds of millions of dollars, great. We'll go through this, right? Uh Luckily, the market kind of fell apart before the audit was supposed to get done. So that company, that offer, you know, kind of poofed away with that company's valuation. Uh, but I couldn't pass an audit because we did not have systems in place, right? So in a different world where the, the market held strong, I probably would have missed out on hundreds of millions of dollars because I couldn't pass an audit. So that's why we signed with Fulfill at some point in 2021 to, to get us ready because we knew this audit and shit was coming. And now we run all of our inventory purchasing, right? One, it's an order management system. So it helps us reroute to the appropriate you know, warehouse, right? So order comes into our website and it has a customized wallet attached to it that can only be filled out of one warehouse. Fulfill takes care of that, right? If it's a split order, Fulfill taking care of all that, saves money and time on you know tickets or whatever. But the big thing is we do all of our inventory purchasing for it now, and we have true costs per PO. We track that inventory through our system, and apparently that helps you pass audits. So don't waste a million dollars on shitty accounting fees. And uh, if you ever get an offer for hundreds of millions of dollars, don't let an audit be the thing that gets in the way. Yeah. And, and, you know, Jason, I'll give you an, uh, so that you're to go back to your question around, um, the, the dot 99, the dot 95 versus the round number. I don't know if you guys have ever noticed, but Apple prices everything in just like normal numbers, like mm -hmm. it's $50. It's not forty nine ninety five. Right. Um, we're actually doing this. I'm doing this test right now on Pila case. I have one phone model, right? Not all of them. One phone model where all of the case prices are a round number. And relative to like our usual, you know, thirty nine ninety five, right? What, like we always had a dot ninety five, and our pricing for the longest time was with the dot ninety five or the dot ninety nine because that's what retailers do, and we were pushing into retail, and we then pulled back our retail because it's a blood, it's a, it's a shit show for mobile accessories. Um, but we never revisited like, well, should we even price with a dot ninety five? Like, what's the point? Right. So now we're actually doing a test. And what I'm testing is like the, um, obviously like for that collection, that phone model, the conversion rate relative to, to its history, but I'm also looking at, um, contribution model, uh, dollars, contribution margin percentage and dollars per, for that phone model per day, pre and post change. You know, I think we're talking about price psychology and yep. I also want to incorporate price buckets, which might brought up, right? I think Mike was running what's called a Dutch auction where it starts at a very high price and then it goes, it, that's used to maximize revenue per item because the highest bidder will, or the, the highest payer will reach it, right? Um, but that's really great for figuring out price buckets. I'm, I'm not suggesting anyone runs Dutch auctions on their website. <laughs> it sounds like a huge pain in the fucking ass, but uh, you'll see that like with like, you know, in, in very fine goods, like sometimes it'll start like at a million dollars and work all the way down. But the price buckets, when I talk to people with t shirt companies, right, I'm like, why you $32? They're like, well, that's what the competitors are at. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm like, What's the difference between 32 and 35 or 32 and 37 or 32 and 39? Like, I think you're doing yourself a disservice by just choosing an arbitrary number. You should think about those buckets, right? And every industry will have different buckets. I think for cars, it's under 25,000, right? Like if you have a car for 22,000 or 24,000 or 2499, like it's the same to customer because it's under 25,000. And in your industry, there is price buckets that naturally occur. You should understand those. And maybe for cookware, it's 400, right? I think 395 or 399 or 399.99, it's all under 400 to a customer. And when you break 400, maybe it's more difficult. But figure out your price bucket first and then figure out your price psychology, right? I, I do think the modern era is simpler is better. Just give them a number. So, so Sean, this is a, we've had this debate internally it's really choosing between three different things. It's three ninety nine, three ninety nine, ninety nine, and then four hundred, right? And we've actually done some some testing 
on it. I'm, I'll actually br I'll bring that data with me next time. I should have brought it. Um, I don't trust the data, to be honest. Like, there's always empirical data doesn't always tell you the right story. You have to ask why, and that's the reason why I haven't necessarily like made a move on it. Um, I do think it looks, just looks way cleaner to be. If it were me, I would choose three ninety nine. Mm. But we are giving away a dollar on every sale, and that does add up over time. I don't know. Jason, you can afford the dollar, but I don't, I don't know if anyone's told you. <laughs> um, but then there's, you know, there's the, does that change the conversion rate? Um, and and I want to push back on you a little bit. Like you this okay. is hyper-focused on the, on the price psychology aspect, right? 399 versus 400. And if you get that extra dollar, have we explored the buckets fully? Because maybe the correct answer for this good is it should be 499. Like, yeah, w like, w and we should do radical tests like that because maybe the bucket for cookware is a lot higher than I think, or 450. Yeah. And maybe 450, there's no change in conversion rate between 399 and 450, right? Well, Once we, you we've done, we've done price testing on individual pans of like 10% increments, different buckets on the pans. Um, I'll have to check and see if we've done them on the sets. Um, sometimes you don't want to mess with what's working pretty well. But. Right. I just I just think all of us could, and I think anyone listening, could use a kick in the pants to get more radical. Because I'll tell you guys about a radical price test we're doing right now where we have pens that sell for $79 and I think $99 or $89. We've marked, so not a markdown. We've just changed the MSRP on those in testing from $79 to $59. We've gone down right? And maybe even as low as 49, like we're trying to figure out what is the good price bucket for pens. And what we've seen is revenue just shot up by like 10 X, right? Like we have like a multi-million, maybe a $10 million a year pen business. By changing that, I think we could have a $30 million a year pen business at, look, the margins are obviously suppressed, right? They're obviously worse and we're not getting any credit because we're not marking them down. We're just seeing if customers will buy them at a lower price it'll end up being way more net profit. So we're, we're doing radical stuff the other way as well. So I think, I think you should always be challenging yourself to look at the price buckets below and above and figure out wh where you should actually sit. The, I think you brought up a really good point, Sean, and I just want to, I want to say a couple of things here that we've, they've come up in the past in the pod, but they're worth saying again. The first is that even though people are not fully rational, supply and demand is real. As your price comes down, demand will go up. And sometimes they'll go up quite violently. And Sean, with your pen example, like that's an example of sometimes you're just not quite competitively priced enough to be considered. And when you move down from seventy nine ninety nine to fifty nine ninety nine, all of a sudden you are really fully in the consideration range, and you realize there is a ton of demand that uh, there were a ton of fish that were looking at the hook and just didn't like what was on it. And so. Being willing to radically test things, even if you can't make the economics work, just to understand is really helpful. And I'll make one more point on that note, which is the most successful retailers in the history of the United States and the world have been discounters. They have made their money by saying, how do we get high quality stuff to people for cheaper? You know, Walmart, Target, Costco, uh, Amazon, this is all of their playbook. And so if it, it will likely be true that when you find ways to get high quality things to people for less money, that there is a lot of enterprise value to be created. But the second point I want to make is when you're creating your pricing, you're actually making a decision about how large the total addressable market of customers is. And the higher you go in pricing, the less customers you're going to acquire. And less doesn't necessarily mean worse. It just means less. And so like Louis Vuitton is for less people with how they price it. And it works great for them. They are a luxury brand. Luxury brands intentionally are trying to go after less people. Like to your example with, with Hexclad, if Hexclad's at $399, there are going to be less customers than if it's at $499. But it might not mean that it's worse. 
It's just different. It's a different way to position the brand. It's a different uh, audience that you're talking to and total addressable market and lifetime user value. And it would be different at $299 than it is at $399. And this is where the hard work as a brand owner is trying to understand how many people you are trying to talk to. And it's easy to just kind of say, we want to talk to everybody. But as all of us have learned, that is a bad idea. Instead, you've got to really figure out who you're trying to talk to. And uh, so anyway, the number of customers you're trying to acquire actually is one of the things that drives. And so to go back to Sean's pen example, one of the reasons why, Sean, I think if pens can drive that much more volume at a lower price, it's the right decision for you, is if you're bringing people into the Ridge funnel with pens, you don't have to. I mean, they can be something that just introduces people to the brand. If they go on to buy rings and go on to buy wallets, who cares if you make money on pens? right? It's just another clever way to customer acquire, for example, or maybe not, but it's just an example of how you can think about parts of your business that way and pricing in relation to the total number of people you're trying to capture and what you're trying to do in other areas. I'm just looking at like all the early decisions we made using North Beam to get to where we are today when we were like 30 million and and 50 million in sales. And, and that's you know, that's sort of where it, we started using it heavily and it really helped us. And I'm, I'm just thinking back to some early advice that I received from other people, not North Beam, when our Facebook ROAS was like sub one. And they're like, you're losing money. You, you cannot spend this money. And every time I think about this, I'm like, actually, if we had listened to those people, we would have destroyed the business. And, I, you know, I give, and Danny and I didn't know that much back in 2020. I think we've learned a lot since then. And, you know, w without North Beam and looking at that complete picture of everything, we really would have destroyed our business uh, by, by listening to the wrong people and not, not at least having one source of truth in, in North Beam. Yeah. And what we think about is, you know, pens don't need to be 80% margin. We can make money on 60% margin pens, right? So if they're at 59 right. bucks, great. That's, that's what they'll be. But Mike, your first point was the most successful retailers are discount retailers. I want to add some clarity to that. There's two categories of most successful retailers, extreme luxury retailers. Way high up and way low. Yeah. yeah. Yep. <laughs> LVMH is market cap is the exact same as Walmart. Walmart trades at, I think, 0.7 revenue, maybe even less, maybe 0.5 mm -hmm. revenue. They trade below the, like they have an, a less than one revenue multiple. LVMH has a 5X or 4X revenue multiple. So they're worth the exact same. One is high volume for everybody. One is low volume for rich people. There's nobody in, in the middle. <laughs> so as, mm -hmm. as a brand, as a brand owner, you should think about that. Like, you know, I guess Nordstrom's is in the middle. They're only worth two billion dollars compared to Walmart's four hundred billion, right? Uh, you know, may, maybe some of the old department stores are in the middle. Whatever, right? It's very difficult to be in the middle. It's way too messy. You could be commodity goods for everybody. You could be luxury goods for a few people. The middle starts to be sort of a dead zone. So you should be thinking about that when you build your brand. We we were told this constantly with Simple Modern is that we were a dead man walking because we were in the middle. We weren't we weren't competing on the low end on price. Like there were there were definitely people that were less expensive, quite a bit less expensive. And then obviously we weren't in, in the luxury price range. And so people have asked me, hey, how were you able to make it work being in the middle? And the answer uh, in our category is actually has to do with being omnichannel. What we're able to do is find a price point where we can live across all the different channels. This price point can work in Target, it can work on Amazon, it can work on our website, it can work, you know, it could even work in club and we can carry it all the way through. And in each of those channels, it's situated differently in the spectrum. So an intermediate price point for us on Amazon is going to be a high price point at Walmart. We're going to be one of the most expensive things, if not the most expensive thing on the shelf. Um, but we can at least have parity with that price point and what we're doing on Amazon and what we're doing on our website. And so it's allowed us to be in the middle. But in general, your advice is absolutely correct, Sean. They'll tell you, don't go in the middle. That's where people die. Uh, 
And I think that the omni-channel nature of the world and how people shop has at least made it possible that you can carve that out. Although maybe it's a much more difficult living to, to carve out. Yeah. Hey guys, let's, let's, I want to knock out this panzerism topic because I know that Sean is going to leave early and I know that I want to hear him on this one. So let's, let's hit it and then we can come back to the pricing. Is that cool? Yeah, let's do it. So sort of related to pricing, I, I got a call a couple of days ago by a young, young guy who has a SaaS business, a few million in revenue and said that he had some interest um, in the business and wanted to talk multiples. Multiples mean nothing. Let's start there. Multiples mean nothing. And here's why. There are three important things that go into the multiple, actually four, and you probably don't know what the, the data points are. So, the, so there's no way of analyzing the multiple unless this is like a public company and that's why those businesses trade on a pe um or an even about multiple um the four factors growth rate margin size and sector size is really important i think it's useful for a lot of people who listen to this pod because there are a lot of people running really good small businesses and they want to know what their what their business is worth and like if you are a three to five million dollar ARR SaaS business, multiples don't mean anything. It's like all about supply and demand. You're just too small. The growth rate factor is just too much. So when I was a banker doing deals for a decade and a half, and people would like compare their multiple to Facebook's multiple or Google's multiple. It's like these deals are a hundred percent about supply and demand. And so it's just, it's kind of funny when people are like really getting hung up on multiples when they just do not have the information like growth rate and profit are like the most massive factors. And then you have sector. Like when I talk to people, about us versus say um, an apparel brand versus say a CPG brand, one sector may be hotter than the other and it's gonna drive the outcomes massively. Like if everyone in your sector is out there raising money at the time or out there trying to do a transaction at the time, that's, that, that, that sends a message. So, um, be realistic and, and realize that like when you're a small business, this is all about supply and demand. And when you see an eye-popping multiple, like what was that Australian um, skincare brand oh. that just sold? The sunscreen? Right? Yeah, yeah, the, sun, the sunscreen. And it's like notionally a 14 times EBITDA multiple. And people are reaching out to me like, oh, then that's that multiple seems pretty high. And I'm like, that multiple seems pretty reasonable if that company is growing so it's like oh well there's 1.1 billion dollar deal at uh 80 some million in EBITDA it's like we just don't know how fast that company is growing unless unless Sean has uncovered that sometime in his part-time uh equity analyst uh position <laughs> but um I just I yeah I don't know I just having this conversation with this guy who's a really smart guy he's got a really cool little business so, yo, I've got a couple of strategics that are interested. I'm like, have you shown them your numbers yet? No. Okay. So they don't even have your numbers. By the, so that's an aside, by the way. Nothing is real until people have your numbers and they actually put a price on the table. Until then, it's like, please realize that nothing you're hearing means anything. Right. Uh, a couple of points. Zimmerman was an Australian luxury brand that just sold 1.6 billion, I believe, on 70 million in EBITDA. It looks like an amazing multiple. We don't, you don't know any details of that business. To, mm -hmm. to, to Jason's point, it's like they could be growing 100x year over year, 10,000 percent year. Mm -hmm. We just don't know. And then Jason's second point: nothing's real until 
it is, right? And like, I would say nothing's real until the money hits your bank account. You can back out a little bit. Maybe a contract execution is real. Maybe an LOI is real. But I've seen deals blow up at every stage of that. Until the money's in your bank account and really until two years post, so there's no clawbacks, that's the most real it gets, <laughs> right? Uh, and then, yeah, Jason, to your point, I, if I could summarize the pantherism, what I learned from it, it is you are worth what someone is willing to pay, right? Like let's remove comps, remove multiples, remove everything because a small business, I mean, people hit me up with like, okay, well, Yeti's trading at X and I'm this. I'm like, or I, I hear, here's a personal story about me being stupid. I talked to a private equity group one time and they're like, hey, look, this is the multiple we'll offer. It's the same multiple Lululemon gets. And I, this was in like, I don't know, like 2020 or whatever. And I was like, we're better than Lululemon. <laughs> Lululemon is, a, is worth $40 billion. <laughs> they trade a 10X revenue or something. And I'm sitting there being like, well, we're better. And he's like, hey, look, man, this is, this is, the, this is the multiple that, that is the best standard in this business. Uh, so you, you should just be well aware that like, multiples and, and comps and everything like it, it really needs to be an apples to apples comparison and i was being very stupid in that moment right um you, the danger it seems like the danger of is just if you own if you own a business you're constantly trying to say like hey what is this thing maybe worth and set expectations and like you're saying jason you look at things in the news you look at other deals you start to kind of get an idea of a number in your head or a multiple you think you're worth and you set an expectation and you're really likely to go to market and be disappointed and feel like people are offering you a lot less than you think your thing's worth. It was never worth that. You created that number out of the air by taking the most favorable interpretations or multiples and only looking at the bright side or whatever. And so, I mean, my, my takeaway is don't, don't look at multiples other people are getting or other acquisitions and try and uh, extrapolate into what your business is worth because you're likely to be disappointed. Yeah. And don't have price history. Like don't hold on to those prices in your head, right? Mm -hmm. The market is a market. It is a dynamic moving target, right? Like at one point, Allbirds was worth $2 billion. Today, they're worth $150 million. That is the market. Now the guy running it could be like, no, we're still worth $2 billion. It's like, that's his personal interpretation of the market, right? Um, but it's, I, I'd say, Jason, it is a good price conversation because like and we should end it on this, which is that price is just what somebody is willing to pay. Whether you're selling a bottle, a wallet, a pan, or a phone case, or a company. At the end of the day, market decides, right? And there might be somebody out there who is willing to, like somebody out there might actually be willing to spend $10,000 on a hex cloud plan, like for sure. Just like there's someone out there that could buy your company for an obscene multiple relative to what other people would pay. We you have know. these gold-plated pans that people keep begging us to produce, actually. <laughs> and maybe those are <laughs> 10K pans. I, I, I would. I would, yeah. I would absolutely come out with the ridiculous thing if I was you. But, Matt, I think you're, you're really on to, uh, to like a real Disney ending of this. We think so often about our products and our prices in the market versus everybody else, right? A retrospective look in. Jason, thank you for tying this, this pans room together. It's, look... You have to think the same way about your price for your company. If you want to sell or you want to exit, it's like, right? Wh who? What are the competitors in the space? Like, what do? What would they sell for? Right? Where do you land on there? What is your value? And I like. There's a buyer at every end of the market, and you're only worth what someone's going to pay. If you asked me to build you a boat, I would charge you ten billion dollars because I don't know how to build a boat. Someone, someone who specializes in boat building will sell it for a million, right? Because they're a, they're a finely tuned machine at that. But people, boats are only worth what someone's willing to pay, which is which is the million dollars. That's why I'm not in the boat business. All right, let's end it on that, guys. Okay, and that is a wrap. We uh we covered just one topic today, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, I learned a lot. It's this is the great thing with this show, right? It's like I just get to talk to my friends, and we all just get to talk to each other. And um, pricing is a like it's a gnarly topic, and there are some like way smarter people than us on this. So I hope you got something out of that. I know I did. Um, until next time.